sometimes translated original people, the Lenape were known as mediators and called the grandfathers, encompassing the Delaware River Basin. Lenape uh, includes present-day New Jersey, most of Delaware, the eastern parts of New York and Pennsylvania, and was home to 20,000 Lenape. Within the first 100 years of foreign contact, 80% of the Lenape had already died from violent conflict and disease. Europeans forced the Lenape westward and northward to Oklahoma, Wisconsin, and Ontario, where many of the descendants live today, named after the suffrage for the duration. Uh, we'll also have noontime concerts throughout uh, November Thursdays in Old Town Hall, the acoustically perfect setting. Uh, and we have 36 people on Thursday afternoon and they go through November, and uh, later uh, this month will be part of the parade, the holiday parade, and each Saturday in uh, December will have a few part of the pop-up holiday village with downtown visions. So today's program uh, has been in the works for a long time, uh, two years certainly, but uh, probably more than like 160 years. <laughs> and, I, um, uh, and it's gonna go something like this. Uh, we're gonna invite some of the speakers up one by one, and I'm one of them, so I'll go second. Um, and uh, it'll encompass the plans that the Grand Opera House has for its, its sesquicentennial, which is no small feat for this historic building and a challenge only community. Um, and I want to uh, feature a little bit of the history of the architect, whose work of design continues to elevate our own sense of the place when we're in the Grand. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about how the grant was saved in the 1970s in a bold and nationally path-breaking effort to renovate the building and revitalize the commercial corridor of Wilmington so soon after the nine-month occupation of, of, by the National Guard in 1968. Uh, and then uh, as part of the semi-successful centennial, I've been getting this confused because America is going to be celebrating its semi sesquicentennial, <laughs> semi-quincentennial uh, at 250 years. So I've uh, been conflating a lot of these commemorations. But uh, part of the effort was to update the history hallway. Uh, and history hallway, if you've been to concerts or affairs at the, uh, at the Grand, it showcases uh, the history of the building and the performers and all the acts and movies that were shown there uh, uh, in the, 20th, the 19th and 20th century. And that effort is involved in the library and our major fellows program here at the Historical Society. And then uh, uh, in part from some of the new information we find out, found out, we'd like to invite Ben Cannon, who's one of our, uh, our community art leaders, to reflect on the role of the grand in the arts uh, ecology of Delaware. So with that in mind, um, I'd like to introduce all our speakers uh, because uh, Pam is coming up next. And Pam uh, Bonaccio is has worked at the Grand Opera for 15 years, uh, serving as the Director of Development, uh, Director of Community Engagement since 2009, and now most recently she's been named the Managing Director. She serves on the board of the Delaware Arts Alliance and as President of the Arts Consortium of Delaware. I will invite her up now. Um, this is a really momentous occasion to uh, acknowledge and celebrate the Grand's 150th anniversary. Uh, and like David said, we started planning this about two years ago. One of the things we um, wanted to, we, we talked about, what would we, what would we focus on? And we decided that it was really important to not only look at the Grand's past, of course it's a very significant history here at the in Wilmington, Delaware, but also its presence, what is our current role in the community, how have we made an impact, and also the future, how do we want to, to continue our impact and, and make a statement and, and make a difference right here in Wilmington. So with that in mind, um, we came up with many, many, many ideas on ways that we can celebrate, and of course, we can't do everything. So we had to whittle that list down to um, a few events and things that would be, uh, of course, doable in the midst of a pandemic. Unfortunately, we couldn't do a lot of big events with that would bring crowds together, but um, we, we put together some really special celebrations. So I just want to mention some of the things that we are doing to celebrate and invite you all to join in some of the other activities. 
Um, so to start, we thank the Delaware Historical Society for hosting and for putting together, um, this was one of the easiest events for me, <laughs> the, this lecture and the, this talk with the, the guest speakers about the grants history and our role in the community. So thank you, David, and thank you to all the staff here. Um, we also have uh, partnered with the DHS and um, worked with one of the speakers that you'll hear from today, Maya Levine, on the start of a project, like David said, the History Hallway is a space in the Grand Opera House that um, it really tells a wonderful story about the history, but it has been there for 20 years. Uh, it hasn't been refreshed in the past 20 years, so it doesn't have anything that has happened in the past 20 years. So we are working on um, both just reorganizing some of the information to find uh, new, in new images and pictures and kind of give you a, a new um, image, new look for the hallway, but also to um, modernize it with some more uh, recent information and, uh, and more recent activities in the community. So I look for that to, to come in the coming months. And uh, we, surprisingly, one of the first events that we opened up with um, had nothing to do with performing arts, but rather we focused on the visual arts. So if you have been in the Grand Opera House, you'll notice that we have a large, yeah, uh, large lobby for both the Baby Grand and the Tea Lobby for Copeland Hall. And the walls there, we made a really nice space to display arts. And for several years now, we have been exhibiting um, different artists, individual artists in each space on a monthly basis. And we would tie those exhibits into the city of Wilmington's Art of the Town, their monthly art week. Um, so when we reopened after the pandemic, one of the first events that we had was on October 1st, uh, the opening of our new exhibit, which features a group show, which we have never done before. Like I said, we've always had individual artists, but this time we have a group exhibit that highlights 25 different artists who have all been featured in the brand before, but now their work is shown collaboratively. We have two art, two pieces of art from each artist, and um, and, and it makes a really wonderful, uh, just a beautiful display and, and a variety of work to kind of look at. And one of the things that touched me when we started putting this together, we put a, a request for artists out to those who have shown at the brand before, and the response that we got from these artists, visual artists, that um, you know, I, I thought we were just putting their works up on the wall and giving them a, a nice opportunity for some exposure. But several of them, we also asked them to write a brief statement about the, their impacts of the, the grand's impact on them or, or why they like showing the grand. And the response that we got from them was so overwhelming so positive that um, I had never realized before that we were making uh, such a strong impact on the visual art community that these artists are really, really appreciated for the opportunity to, to create an exhibit. And for some of them, it's maybe their first time that they've exhibited inside the grand. Um, to have their work seen by the audiences, thousands of audience members that come through for, to see shows at the grand, but then also get to enjoy their artwork during pre-show time or intuition time, so, and also during the art group receptions. And uh, the words that they came and that, that came back to us for their artist statements um, were so compelling that we decided to put them all together in a booklet. So if you come by to uh, the Grand Galleries, um, you can see the art show, but also take home a booklet that uh, shows all the pieces that are on the wall and read the statements from his artists because their words are really, um, really touching and moving. And, um, and not only are they excited to hang on the walls, they are also excited to give back to the brand. And every single one of the artists, by their choice, uh, have offered to make a donation. If their artwork sells on the walls, they will donate a percentage of their sales back to the Grand Opera House to support our Arts campaign. So I really appreciate them, and, um, and it's been a really wonderful partnership to do that. The next event that we have coming up is actually tomorrow, and this is another one that's close to my heart. Uh, we're turning the grant back to a movie house. So you'll hear a little bit more about this when we, when we get into the history of the grant, but back in the early 1900s, it, was, uh, it became a full-time movie house, um, leased by Warner Brothers Studios. 
And um, we decided to turn back the hands of time and open it up as a movie house once again. So we're showing movies, classics from the 1930s through the 60s. We got something for all ages. So the intention is for multi generations to come in and enjoy the movies together. So we have um, starting in the morning at 11 a.m. We have Pinocchio. So you know, grandparents and for your grandchildren get to see uh, Pinocchio on the big screen. This is from 1940. Um, at 2 p.m. we have a Western, because when Grand was open, it was known for Westerns and action films. So we're showing High Noon, um, which is from the 1950s, I believe. And then at 5 p.m. we'll show A Raisin in the Sun, um, I think that's from the 1960s. And then at 8 p.m. we'll have a classic, the iconic hero, The Adventures of Robin Hood from 1938. So um, it's, again, something for everybody to enjoy. Uh, all ages um, can come in, and we're also featuring two more elements in this day. We are going to be showing um, a tribute video that we created back in 2009 that honors the grand pioneers who um, were responsible for the restoration in the 1970s. So that's a, a small 15-minute uh, clip that we'll show before each feature film. And we're also opening up for tours. So if you want to get a tour of the Opera House and learn more about the history and see it in person, we'll have two tours scheduled at 115 and 415. Um, and those tours will start, um, kind of launch into a new schedule that we're hoping to announce where the brand will be open on a more regular basis to the public. For sharing that history. Um, I mentioned we're refreshing the history hallway and that we're working with Maya Levine and another partnership with the Delaware Historical Society. And I'd like to thank the uh, Delaware Heritage Commission. Uh, we get has awarded us a Pernell Challenge grant in support of that project. And we are also reprinting a publication that was really important to the restoration of the brand. So I have one original copy here. This is the book called The Grand Strategy, The Scenario for Saving the Grand Opera House. It is written by our very own guest, Bob Stoppard. And uh, we, have, we are in the process of reprinting and making this available to folks to, again, learn more details about the restoration in the 70s. Um, finally, we have the month of December and uh, several events coming up. So I invite everybody to check out um, uh, the easiest to find more information on our website, but on Saturday, December 4th, is the Grand Gala, which of course will give some tribute to the um, sesquicentennial anniversary. Um, that will be an event at the Playhouse. The performance is a concert version of Summer, the Donna Summer musical that's in the Playhouse for that weekend. And then because of the pandemic, we have uh, an after party on the go. So you'll get a, a swag bag and coupons and the attention is for you all to go out and celebrate and um, at other businesses in downtown Wilmington. And our New Year's Eve concert, which is returning to Grand, it's been a while since we hosted New Year's Eve, but we are very excited to bring back the Delaware Symphony Orchestra and singers from Opera Delaware, along with a guest soloist, Barney Stokes Mitchell, who is a Tony Award winning Broadway. Um, performer, and uh, they will put together a, a wonderful concert to uh, celebrate our New Year's Eve and help bring in the um, turn of 2022. Um, finally, our birth date is December 22nd, and uh, Grant is doing a more intimate birthday party on that day. We hope there's so much else going on. It's going to stay a very small event, um, but we are planning on doing a ribbon cutting in the front and, uh, and reception and birthday cake. So. There are lots of ways that we are celebrating. Um, before I leave the podium, I just um, want to make sure everybody uh, has their invitation. Please check out the website, uh, check out all the events that are coming up and come join us for any of these. Feel free to contact me directly if you have questions and keep your eye on the programming schedule. We are looking at some very special programming to come in early 2022 that would again celebrate uh, historic historically um, some of the past performances that we have in the brand. We'd like to try to bring back. So that's something we're working on and um, something to tease you with. And I hope to see faces over there throughout the year. So thank you again, David. 
Thank you to all of our speakers for joining us today on this very special program and to all the guests for debating and showing your interest. Great, thank you, Pam. Uh, and I, I want to uh, also um, recognize that there are a couple of executive directors of the grant here. Uh, Dave Fleming, a former director, and I believe I see Mark Fields has joined us. So um, I'm in the presence of the Tony Young Visible Collections Gallery, and we have Tony Young's book, 19, uh, this 1976 History of the Grant. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, what I'm uh, here to say is, I know very little about the history of the grant. And that's why I want to present a little bit of a different take on um, the history of the grant by way of examining the architect and Thomas Dixon's imagination and vision through some of his other work and consider where the grant fits into um, his larger body of work. Uh, in part because uh, I learned a few things, and uh, including, you know, just a, a realization of what a remarkable collection of buildings we have here on Market Street. But the grant stands out uh, from the various colonial and uh, commercial and mercantile buildings. Uh, but there are also a lot of theaters on Market Street, um, so its design seeks to elevate us, and it stands out in part because it takes us up. And when we're in the presence of great art, that takes us up. When we're in the presence of a great performance like the symphony or the opera or performers like Brian Stubbs Mitchell or, or many others, um, it elevates us as human beings. And I think that was part of the vision of uh, Thomas Dixon, who lived uh, in the 19th century and is a woman told it. And his, uh, his early biographies talk about he's a Presbyterian architect, which is worth noting. Um, but I would also just uh, point out that in the, um, in the in 1971, when they did the, the launch on December 22nd to celebrate the centennial, the donation was $500, which would today be $3,250. So if you yeah. aren't going to anything for the grant in the coming months uh, that Pam has announced, consider making a historically accurate donation for about $3,250. <laughs> Um, the architect was born in Wilmington, and uh, he became one of the founders of the Baltimore chapter of the uh, American Institute for Art. Thomas Dixon uh, 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 did a few uh, buildings in Wilmington in the 1850s, uh, and he was a partner with his brother and then two other people, including Thomas Carson, for a few years when they made the grant. And he died in 1886, but he had a really important impact on the region especially in, uh, in Maryland, um, and all of it is worth exploring. And I use some of my own photographs that are slightly askew, in part to suggest I'm going to be putting the grand in a different context, a slightly different angle from how we've looked at it. Um, I, uh, uh, this history isn't necessarily about which movies were shown and, and which president spoke at the grand, but rather uh, what the building means to us in different contexts. And that's the nature of the program. We'll have an opportunity for all the speakers to answer your questions at the end of our presentations, but I'd like you to just consider the grant in different contexts. So Dixon um, was chosen in 1869 uh, out of a competition of five architects, and uh, originally there was going to be, the location was actually going to be where the Queen is next door, uh, which was known as the Indian Queen Hotel. Uh, and um, uh, for a variety of reasons, the land at the top of 8th uh, was better suited for the opera, uh, and, or the, Mas the Masonic Lodge and Opera House, as it was called. Um, and so consider that. Instead of the reggae music we hear blasting in at 4 o'clock, so yeah, we might have had the opera or the symphony playing next door. Um, and it was uh, uh, the, 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 the Clayton House was one of the more prominent hotels. It was actually it had been designed uh, by Dixon uh, earlier in his career, and it looked very different than what the Queen does now. The grant uh, was budgeted at eighty thousand uh, dollars in uh, its original construction plans in 1870, which amounts to one point six six one million dollars in today's money. Uh, and that didn't account for the interior. The seats and the stage all cost an additional $16,000, uh, actually more like $20,000 in 1870 money, and that would have been an additional 
additional $350,000. So the brief partnership of Dixon and Carson um, made an impact, uh, and that uh, was really short life. Charles Carson went off on his own to design a number of buildings in Baltimore before his own time of death at the age of 44, whereas Dixon continued a really important career. Uh, and the grant was one of the, I think it was the third largest stage in the country when it was opened, with a seating of 1,400. And it was reached through a narrow hallway that had a good around with awnings covering the various stores and tea shops. So um, the, the current grant uh, uses some of those motifs in its, in its uh, sort of facade uh, areas, but the awnings are gone. And if you've ever been on this side of Market Street on a hot, sunny day, you know that the awnings are are necessary. Um, but Dixon's early work has a lot of stamps in residential and churches that are worth considering when we consider the Opera House. Um, this is in Newcastle, and of course Newcastle is known for its colonial and federal architecture, like the, the National Historic <coughs> Landmark George Reed House and Gardens. Um, and this is one of Dixon's uh, uh, and his brother's uh, designs in Newcastle the Leslie Travers Mansion. It's very gothic. It looks like something straight out of last week's Halloween uh, pageants uh, with a, kind of a wedding cake, high spires, a variety of ornamentation, uh, pitched gables, and uh, these kinds of features show up again and again in his work, much of which shows up on the National Register for Historic Places, uh, whether residential or church. Um, Dixon, outside of Baltimore, established a, a small railroad summer in, uh, shortly after uh, the Civil War in the 1860s. And you notice how uh, similar the Dixon Hill House here on the left, it's a whole campus of residential houses uh, near uh, uh, Mount Washington in uh, Baltimore, just outside of Baltimore, not far from Pimlico. Uh, so that this historic uh, residence is, is very similar to the one in Newcastle. And also in Baltimore, uh, they designed the Shepherd Pat Pratt uh, Gothic Gatehouse, which is part of a larger infirmary complex that's, on, uh, that's actually a National Historic Landmark. But again, you see the high Gothic spires, pitched gables, really ornamental uh, uh, components that um, sort of uh, bring an uh, eye to the skies. Uh, across from that neighborhood, Dixon Hill, is a building that Dixon designed called the Octagon. And I never even heard of this building. Uh, Dixon designed this. It, it is an eight-sided building made of remarkable material, mostly brick and iron. Uh, and it was part of the, uh, the Mount Washington Female Seminary. It's now a conference center for Johns Hopkins. Uh, but you can see some of the details in the interior uh, on the right that uh, recall uh, some of the staircases or the balustrades in the in the grand uh, theater at the opera house. So, uh, does this look familiar? You know, right? A little bit, and, and even this, in a sort of community building of a campus, bring your eyes upward, much like our eyes go to the murals of the ceiling of the grand. And uh, just to make the point, even the balustrades on the balconies uh, of the grand have that kind of ornamentation and detail reflecting the high Gothic. The design elevates our experience of the buildings. Um, so uh, he also did another opera, how, uh, opera meeting house, or better, uh, better yet, an odd fellows hall at Opera House. This is in Elkton, Maryland, not far away. All not as uh, perhaps not as ornamental, but it's certainly as elevated and and vertical, um, and it's still standing. Um, this is his most noteworthy. Wilmington uh, Commission, uh, Grace, uh, Grace Methodist Church. He did a lot of Methodist Church is for a Presbyterian architect. Uh, and this is uh, one of uh, Wilmington's most notable architectural buildings, and it, of course it's really high Gothic as well, the spires, the pitch. And a couple of the features include three bay windows, which is uh, a, a pretty, uh, pretty high style uh, Gothic ornamentation. Uh, and you'll see that on the other churches that I'm about to show you, uh, like this one in St. Louis uh, from the, the, the same period as Grace in the late 1860s. Uh, do the, 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 the balconies of this church remind you of anything? Similarly, 
uh, in uh, Earlville, Maryland, 1872, the St. Stephen's Episcopal Church, uh, 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 sort of, uh, it, it incorporated earlier uh, components of a building that had been uh, of, of two very uh, earlier churches on that property. And this was pretty commonplace uh, for Gothic revival motifs, very, uh, a, a lot of abundant uh, um, ways to structure the windows and let more light in. And that included the, the archways or the, the, the front flying buttresses to support what was needed to, to construct stone buildings. And often in, in high Gothic, they had patterned and colored stones to really make it uh, even more ornate. Um, this is probably his most noteworthy uh, uh, design next to the Wellington Grand Opera House, and that is the Mount Vernon United Methodist Church. If you've ever seen the Washington uh, Monument in Baltimore on Charles Street, uh, not far from the Lafayette Monument, beside the Peabody Institute, uh, this church was built in 1872 and was on the site of the home of John Edgar Howard, uh, whose son uh, married the uh, daughter of Francis Scott Key, the uh, composer of the Star Spangled Banner, the National Anthem, who died on this very spot. Um, and the house was demolished, and uh, in its place was built the uh, fabulous church that uh, takes up most of this uh, um, section of Baltimore known as Mount Vernon. And this is the interior of this church, which um, brings a new level to that uh, vaulted design. And there's a reason for that, and that is iron. And after the 1860s and after the Civil War, the iron framing was really a key to elevating architectural design. And the, the grand would look very different if it weren't for iron. It probably wouldn't be as vaulted and high. So these mini columns were made possible not by stone, but by strong structural iron. Uh, and the, the windows, those lancelet windows, are often in groups of three. You'll notice that on the facade of the Grand Opera. So it's all really meant to impress you and draw your eyes up to the sky. So here are some further later high Gothic churches designed by Dixon. These are in Baltimore. I mean, these, this isn't just wedding cake. This is this is something uh, a very befitting a kind of a castle-like experience uh, that uh, that suggests um, there's more to it than just a place to worship. There's a place to consider a meaning uh, on the earth in a, in a kind of a spiritual elevation just through the architecture. Uh, and again, also the high work the Gothic in these later works in span throughout the country um, in um, various denominations. And there's some similarities on the outside and then some similarities on the inside. And they all recall features that we uh, know and love when we go to shows at the Grand. Uh, he also did what uh, I like to call High Victorian Gothic, or Hotel Gothic. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and this is the one I could find in, in Baltimore, the St. James Hotel, uh, which is actually still standing. And uh, this is, you see the, the triplet windows and the, the high spires, uh, all of which is made uh, possible by the iron. But this is very similar to the Grand Forest, more similar on the exterior than just about any of the churches. And the iron made it possible. The iron work done on the grand was done by the Royer Brothers of Philadelphia. Their building at 9th and Montgomery Avenue uh, still has, it's still standing, it still has this iron uh, a column that has the Royer Brothers etched into it on the cast iron um, uh, uh, tower. And the cast iron facade of the Grand Opera is one of its most noteworthy commissions. Um, when the U.S. Capitol dome was completed after the Civil War. That was seen as sort of a high point of the use of wrought iron and cast iron uh, framing, and it changed the game for what could be done in the of so steel entered the picture. So it's very 19th century, and when you go on the Library of Congress uh, website to see the Historic American Building Survey collections, when you go to the library, or when you go to the Grand Opera page, it calls the Grand one of the finest remaining examples of 19th century cast iron architecture. So you notice now the three, the, the triplets of windows, the high vaulting, the iron helps take us up a little bit higher. The design and the experience is meant to elevate us, and that was Thomas Dixon's vision. Um, and if it weren't for the efforts of the 1970s, this would not be a fine remaining example. 
Um, so when you consider updating the history hallway, hallway suggests we go down something horizontally. Let's remember that the design of the Grand Opera brings us up vertically and it raises us to a higher level, whether it's by the artists we're seeing perform or the very ground we're standing on with the, the artists and the craftsmen and the craftsmen and the architects and the and the preservationists help to maintain so that we continue to elevate our game and consider our own work uh, in those contexts. But it's all, all about the, the Gothic and the Victorian here. Uh, just a reminder that uh, uh, the federal uh, gem in Newcastle is going to have a great party on December 11th, the lit for the holidays. That's my last promotional announcement. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I did just want to, uh, for us to consider the architect to help us consider the building in a little bit different light than just the facts and the details, but how we're present in the imagination uh, of a very substantial minute minor architect, Thomas Dixon, and Wilmington Nader. So uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to our next speaker. And it is not the refreshing history hallway, uh, but we'll get to that in a minute. But uh, I'd like to turn it over now to Bob Sarger to talk about uh, the incredible effort to save and revitalize the grant. And uh, Bob Sarger uh, was working then with the Greater Wellington Development Council, and it was organized uh, on December 22nd when they uh, they, uh, they organized the Grand Gala held on December 22nd, 1971. Uh, that became a, it launched a statewide effort to save the Grand Opera House, then a badly neglected movie theater, uh, and, and which there were quite a few on Market Street at the time. And as staff from the Grand Opera House incorporated Bob led to all phases of the restoration and some of the reopening during the nation's bicentennial in July of 1976. And, and, and then it was opened as the Delaware Center for Performing Arts. He wrote the grand strategy, the scenario for saving the Grand Opera House in Wilmington, Delaware, published by Preservation Press. It's now out of publication. Uh, the the successful centennial effort is bringing that back into circulation, which is grand. Um, and uh, that successful centennial effort not only made an impact in Wilmington and the cultural community, but it also led to the foundation of the League of Historic American Theaters called LCAT. Uh, and the grant was really uh, one of the founding components of that, and it's now a national organization. And it essentially got started by the vision of Bob Sutter and the efforts to, to rejuvenate and revitalize the Market Street Corridor with uh, preserving and activating one of its greatest buildings. So, thank you. Uh, I hope you consider the grant in many contexts. And now let's take it over and uh, turn it over to Bob Sutter. Thank you, David, for that very interesting lecture. I, I never knew that Thomas Dixon was a Presbyterian. <laughs> and I wasn't going to say anything about this, but I was a Presbyterian minister in West Philadelphia before I came to the Grand uh, on the staff of DWDC. So uh, it just boggles <laughs> my mind that there was this connection. The restoration of the Grand Opera House is too long a story to cover this afternoon. Therefore, I will limit my talk to the origin of the project. Exactly 50 years ago, in its earliest stages, for it was in this period from 1971 to 1973, that the elements of the overall strategy to preserve the Grand and return it to its historic place as a center for the performing arts, evolved and then were reapplied throughout the rest of the project. The origin of the Grand's restoration began in 1971 and can be traced back to two widely separated events in 1967. Locally, <coughs> Eric Kelmark and the Wilmington Opera Society hired architect Bill Pelham to study the feasibility of performing operas in the Grand, then a sadly neglected movie theater. But the time was not right and the idea proved unrealistic for several reasons. Meanwhile, that same year, 
I visited a friend in Columbus, Georgia, who was eager to show me the beautifully restored Springer Opera House that was reopened downtown for live performances. That visit, vision, that visit turned out to be fortuitous for Wilmington. When I came here as an education director for the Greater Wilmington Development Council, GWDC, in June of 1968, the National Guard was patrolling the streets after the racial unrest and rioting that accelerated the city's decline. It seemed to be that Wilmington lacked a heart, a place where diverse elements of the community could gather for events of shared interest and could foster a sense of unity. I first learned about the Grand from news journal columnists Bill Frank and Otto Deckel, who wrote about its history and bemoaned its endangered status on Market Street. In 1970, my wife Judy and I decided to check it out for ourselves by going to a James Bond double feature, <laughs> Goldfinger and to Russia with Love, <laughs> one Sunday afternoon. The floor was sticky from spilled soda and crushed candies, and the seats were covered with graffiti and so filthy that we kept our coats on. When the lights went out, when the lights went on, we saw walls covered by thick, maroon, acoustical fabric and oppressive drop ceiling above us. The only historical remnant was the graceful, curved balcony supported by cast iron pillars and faced with the lovely cast iron filigree that had been painted over a pea soup green. That was our first impression of the brand. <laughs> After finishing a major education project in the spring of 1971, I asked my boss, Pete Larson, if I could work on saving the brand. Given, given that revitalizing Market Street was a GWDC priority, he readily gave his blessing. But before starting out, I thought it best to sit down with the GWDC board member who was responsible for the Playhouse and ask if he had any objections to my trying to stir up interest in saving the grant. He said, no, go ahead, you'll never do it. <laughs> Theaters are bottomless pits. <laughs> Since Tony Young's The Grand Experience, A History of the Grand Opera House had yet to be written, I started by researching The Grand in the Wilmington Library. I had to comb through reels of news journal microfiche until I got back to the article on The Grand's reopening on The Grand's opening night on December 22nd, 18. Seven, one. Eureka! It was the Grand Centennial, and there were still six months to celebrate. <laughs> Furthermore, the reels did not go back any further than 1871. It was the newspaper's centennial. A unique window of opportunity opened for the project. The obvious next step was to enlist the help of news journal editor John Craig, who agreed to collaborate with me. Next, I went to Craig Gilborn and Polly Buck at the new Delaware State Arts Council, who confirmed the need for a suitable performing arts venue for the Wilmington Symphony, which was then playing in the Salesian Auditorium and the opera society that found the acoustics of the playhouse less than desirable. Aware that WSFS had purchased all the properties down to the ground, 
John and I then enlisted Bank President Fred O'Donnell to join us. Thus, we had a critical nucleus to initiate the effort. To sell John, Fred, and Craig on my vision of what the brand could become, I convinced them to fly with me at their expense to Columbia, Columbus in September to see the restored Springer Opera House for themselves. There, a gracious member of the Springer Board showed us the building. He then put us up in his home and treated us to dinner and a performance of Kiss Me Kate in the theater. When we boarded our flight home, we all had a shared and very concrete vision of what a restored brand could become and do for Wilmington. To enlist the community's support, we decided to take advantage of the December 22nd date and plan a gala for the centennial anniversary of the Grand's opening night. With GWDC support, I organized the event. In less than three months, we formed and expanded steering committee, hired an event coordinator, lined up a dozen local groups to perform, rented and cleaned up the theater, and made the stage operable. Meanwhile, John and the News Journal, John had the News Journal run articles and features leading up to the date, while I organized a scripted news conference at which Governor Russ Peterson, County Executive Bill Connor, and Mayor John Babiars took turns announcing the gala and the goal of restoring the brand. With all the publicity and so many diverse organizations and performers involved, we generated a great deal of excitement. And with the help of Larry Wilker of the University Theater Department, sold out the house within days. But there, the project took a turn that almost derailed it. The evening started off well, with 1,200 ticket holders and city, county, and state officials, including Senator Bill Roth and Congressman Pete DuPont, streaming into the grand. Some even arrived in frolic Weymouth horse-drawn carriages, while others came in Victorian costume. However, once everyone was packed inside, the program featuring 12 acts of uneven quality <laughs> by some 200 amateur performers <laughs> took four hours. <laughs> by the time the Mendelssohn Club Chorus from Philadelphia got on at 11.30, and Governor Peterson lifted his glass of champagne to toast the grand old lady of Market Street at midnight. Half the hall was empty. <laughs> While the lead up to the gala had been a huge success, the event itself was an artistic disaster. In his scathing review, Otto Decker took me to task for not knowing what I was doing. And he was correct. In that, in trying to involve so many performers and be as inclusive as possible, I had not paid heed to the quality and length of their performances. Almost blowing the whole thing up, I was, it was personally very painful. Nevertheless, the gala focused the community's attention on the ground, and we learned the hard way to showcase from then on only the best in the performing arts. To his eternal credit, John Craig, bless his memory, was not dissuaded. Rather, he quickly recruited lawyer Bill Pripper, God bless him to head the project. With my assistance, 
Bill set up Grand Opera House Incorporated and recruited well-connected people, including our dear Kitty Reese, later Kitty May, who set the standard for excellence in the restoration. She, plus Barbie Ringo, Judy Curtig, and Tony Young, among others, made up the board. John carried, carried it, <coughs> John chaired it with Bill as president and me as secretary. So again, we have recruited people capable of moving us forward. Next, while Coleman Dorsey drafted an agreement, Bill met with each of the 12 Masonic Hall Lodge, Company Lodges and negotiated a 100-year transfer of the building title to Grand Opera House Incorporated for $10. In return, we would maintain and operate the building as a performing arts center and raise at least $1 million to restore it. An office was established in the Grand with Marie Conti as office manager and me as director of development and jack of all trades. We next quietly raised $60,000 from foundations and businesses and a few individuals and that allowed us to remove all the old seats, all the acoustical fabric and the movie screen and thoroughly clean and fix up the theater. We did some repainting and then installed used seats, two film projectors, and a large screen curtain donated from the Aldean next door. Simultaneously, Tom Watson, also of the University Theater Department, volunteered to make the stage operable. Larry Wilker was returned to plan and manage a trial season that opened with the Wilmington Symphony under Van Lannan followed by the Cleveland Orchestra with Daniel Barenboim, the Vienna Boys Choir, the Berlin Concert Choir and Orchestra, the Harkness Ballet, and Center Stage of Baltimore. We sold season subscriptions for $25, as well as single tickets, and we ended with a deficit of only $5,058. Six classic films sold well, too. Meanwhile, I gave VIP tours, including one to a future president of the United States, who later hand-delivered to me a flag flown over the Capitol to raise over the land. This first season demonstrated that the Grand's excellent acoustics were still there, and it could again showcase the performing arts. It also revealed that there were audiences to support a variety of live offerings. And we had developed certain strategies that we repeated throughout the rest of the project, beginning with the next phase of determining the project's economic and architectural feasibility and the feasibility of raising the necessary, necessary funds. Those strategies included doing our homework, hiring professional expertise as needed, setting challenging goals and deadlines, learning from our mistakes, and pushing on through setbacks. But most important of all was involving local people who could make it happen. We must leave the story there for now, but I hope this recap of these initial stages will entice you to buy and read a copy of a brain strategy, the scenario for saving the Grand Opera House, Wilmington Younger. A brief case study I wrote for the National Trust for Historic Preservation, published by Preservation Press in 1978. As Pam said, the Centennial reprints will be on sale at Grand Performances and online at thegrandwilmington.org. Hebrew scripture tells us that we gain immortality both through our children and by being remembered. Therefore, in celebrating the Grand's sesquicentennial, let us remember those grand pioneers to whom a grand strategy is dedicated 
where it was due to their collective passion, persistence, and yes, personal sacrifices, that Wilmington's Grand Opera House reopened in time for the nation's bicentennial in 1976 and was restored to its historic place and remains today the beating heart of Wilmington. Thank you. That was fantastic, and it really reminds us uh, that this was not an inevitable project, that it really took leadership and will and community action. Um, it reminds me that one way to think about historic preservation is the responsible management of change. And the neighborhood and the city was changing, and the, the, the uses of the building had to change as well. It also reminds us um, of the reasons why we preserve old things. Why old things matter, why old places matter, include personal associations, continuity, and beauty. And our connections to the grain have all of that. Uh, there have been a lot of recent studies about the cognitive effect of great architecture or old places, whether they be battlefields or community burying grounds or grand palaces and cathedrals or just walking in the steps of Abraham Lincoln or Jackie Robinson. We, there's a physiological effect where we're in the space of beauty or what's going before us. And that sense of experience is certainly there with the grand. And Bob's uh, remarks also remind us of the role of women in historic preservation. And the, the work of the grand could not have been done without the great efforts you had with the team that you assigned. Which brings us to a young woman who's done a fair amount of work on researching the grand. Uh, to be our next speaker, and that's Maya Levine, who is uh, a student at Cab Calloway, and I want us to go uh, um, at the, the Cab Calloway School for the Arts. Uh, and she was a, a major fellow. Uh, that's our uh, junior fellows program during the summer. We have really great teenagers work with the staff of the Delaware Social Society, and I know Perry Major. Junior and Maya Levine was this uh, one of the seven major fellows this summer, and she had the direct experience of working with this, uh, the uh, sesquicentennial committee of the grant on updating and refreshing the history hallway, and she did so uh, in ways that honored uh, the work of the past, but also uh, incorporated new research. And we'd like Maya to tell us a little bit about it. Thank you. First of all, I cannot say how much of an honor it is to speak after Mr. Stoddard. I think I read his book four times this summer, and it's an amazing book, and I think you should all buy it. But it was a great honor to see him speak, and thank you. Um, okay, so this summer I was a Bachelor Fellow at the Historical Society, and my work was with the Esther Hallway, as is in Wilson. <laughs> my work was not with the Bachelors. Okay. <laughs> So um, just for some more context, as part of this fellowship, uh, me and myself and six other high schoolers were chosen and we were each given projects around Wilmington relating to Wilmington's history. And mine was about the Grand Opera House, obviously, which was a really nice partnership because um, the work that I've been doing at Cab Calloway throughout middle and high school has actually been in theater. I'm currently a technical theater major at the school, so I've always had an interest in theater, and I think that local art is just really important. Um, and I think that the grant has always been very exciting to me every time I go to the grant, it's thrilling. So um, I think that preserving artistic culture in Wilmington is very important, and I think that our experience in this past year without live theater is really a testament to how much we need live theater. And in doing my research this summer, I found that we have always needed live theater um, and people care enough to save programs and pictures and memories of theater in the past. And I'm hoping that we'll be able to continue saving memories of theater in the future. And that is what we are hoping to do with this week Okay. So um, everyone has given bits and pieces about the history of the Grand, but I think that we should take a little walk through the history hallway 
to give you all a little bit a little bit of context about every era of the Grand. So in the 1860s and 1870s, um, Dr. Young spoke quite a bit about Thomas Dixon's work in constructing the Grand, um, but I'll speak a little bit about the Masons. So they, in the late 1860s, they were looking for a place to hold their meetings. They needed a temple. Um, and traditionally, um, in the Islamic tradition, they actually don't do any of their work on the first floor of a building because of security reasons and rituals and things like that. So they actually usually will have some kind of community space on the first floor and then do all their work on the second and third floors. So they decided that there was a community need for an opera house and that was what they were going to do. And then obviously with a little bit of stuff in between, this great opera house came about. So on December 22nd, 1871, the grand was open to the public. And then for several decades after that, they had a series of amazing performers, um, international symphony orchestras, and comic opera was really popular in the late 1880s. Um, there were a lot of traveling companies who loved to come to Wilmington. One of my favorite things that I got to read this summer was about the Wilmington taste and how people in Wilmington don't have the classiest of taste, they'll be like everything. And it just made me laugh because I was like, yeah, that was about right. <laughs> but, um, so they had all of these performers for several decades, and then in the 1900s, um, as Ms. Minocchio talked about, it became a movie house, and they were showing um, westerns. There were three or four other theaters also owned by Warner Brothers on Market Street, so they were kind of showing the B-list movies of the Grand, and then it um, sort of fell into decay a little bit, into disrepair, um, and then I don't think I can say anything else after Mr. Stoddard about the renovation. So. Um, in the 1970s, after the renovation, it, it sort of returned to what it once was. It was this um, community center on Market Street. Um, they had they hosted several performers from all over the world once again, and it was just it came back to being this community landmark for the city of Wilmington. And in 2000, the Baby Grand was opened, as you can actually see in that picture. In the second photo, that brick wall is the original outside wall of the Grand. So the history hallway is off the lobby of the Baby Grand. So as you're walking down it, you're actually right where there used to be space between the brand and the building next to it. So that's where the baby grand is now. Um, so that was opened in 2000, and it was opened, it's a 300 seat theater as opposed to a 1400 seat theater. And it was actually open to fulfill a desire of local artists to have a place to do um, more experimental um, performances for a smaller audience because people were having to go to Philadelphia to present sort of their cutting edge work. So they decided that they would build a smaller theater in Wilmington, um, and that was the Baby Grand. And then in 2015, the Grand acquired the Playhouse on Rodney Square, and they just completed a $1 million renovation to allow for um, larger Broadway touring companies and to attract them to the Playhouse. And actually, being built in 1913, the Playhouse is the longest theater continuously on the Broadway touring circuit, which is really exciting. <laughs> okay. So in reimagining the history hallway, as Ms. Minocchio talked about, the first thing that we obviously need to do is update the hallway. Basically, the information ends in the late 1970s, early 1980s, and so much has happened since then with the Baby Grand and the Playhouse and all of the modern programming. And something we talked about a lot um, with my fellow major fellows was crafting a historical narrative and just the idea of how can we tell one story from as many perspectives as possible. So one thing that I felt when I looked in the Grand Hallway initially was that we were seeing the perspective of the Grand from people from the Grand to people from the Grand. And I felt that Wilmington, um, the Grand has played such a large role in Wilmington, which Mr. Kenny will expand on more. But I think that um, one of my goals when researching the historical hallway was to find as many perspectives as we can to include and present and share. Um, and one of those one of the sort of terms that came up a lot over the summer with my fellow major fellows from the historical society was silencing in history. And this isn't necessarily a malicious or even intentional action, but just by nature of how memory works, we're often going to leave out some story and some perspective. And that was just something that I kept in mind as I did my research over the summer was which perspective are we missing? Where did that information go? How can we find it and include it? I'm not great at this. <laughs> I think, thank you. I'm sorry. 
Um, so in searching for those silences, one of the things that I really looked for throughout the summer was the involvement of people of color in the earlier years of the grant, because it was just not something that I could find information on anywhere, really. Um, until I visited the Paul Preston Davis collection, which is in here, and there's some of it up on display out there. Um, Mr. Davis was a Wilmingtonian who saved a lot of a lot of stuff from Wilmington, a lot of very well organized things. He especially saved a lot of trade cards from businesses, which are little cards that businesses would hand out, um, just advertising different things. And they were really meant to be thrown out, and Mr. Davis saved what seems like every single trade card he ever received. Um, and one of them that I came across was this trade card for the opera, the HMS Pinafore. And as you can see, it's a performance from 1879, and it's being advertised specifically that there were people of color in this opera in 1879. Um, so I saw this and I was felt I felt like it may lead me to a little bit of filling in that gap um, of that experience at the Grand. So then I looked on a newspaper database and found an ad a more detailed advertisement for that same performance, May 24th, 1879. Um, and reading this from a 2021 20, perspective, I was appalled by the language used and the way that they objectify people. Um, and then I went on to have several conversations with. Um, my other fellows from the historical society, people from the Grand, um, my mentor in the research library, Ray Kimberg, we talked a lot about this, um, and just the way that it, the way that it may have come across to different perspectives. You know, on one hand, it was obviously a milestone for um, an opera completely cast for people of color to be performing at a venue like the Grand, that was. Um, a really massive venue in Wilmington, um, but on the other hand, why why is the advertisement pointing out that it's not blackface, but it's quote unquote the real thing? That seems like to be one of the selling points, and you know what does that mean? And that was something that I just had a lot of conversations about over the summer, and I think that those are the kind of conversations that we need to be having. Are um, what is this event, and what are the different perspectives, and how should we consider it, and how should we move forward with that information? So I think that that's something that has been really important in the research we've been doing about the history of the grant, and it's something that we'll continue to ask questions about, is where are those silences and how do we fill them in? Okay, so now I want to talk a little bit um, about the progress that has been made that we also wanted to um, mention in the history hallway. So something I talked before about uh, the grant, the history hallway being by the grant, for the grant, essentially. And I think that's something that we're looking to include more is about the grand role in the Wilmington community, which Mr. Cannon will talk about in a minute. But I think that um, the grand has really shown recently in the past 20 years since the hallway was created that they have a major commitment to Wilmington as a community. And it's not just a solitary institution, but they're working with local artists, um, like on their group display that's up at the grand right now. And then also something that really caught my eye as I was doing research about the modern grant was this ac the accessible programming that is available now. So there are sensory friendly shows where you can bring kids or anyone who just doesn't um, feel comfortable with uh, a standard show and they don't have to sit there the whole time and if it's too loud they can leave and things like that. And I thought that that was really interesting and that just adds another perspective of theater which is um, how is that experience for people with children or people who um, don't want to go to a normal show um, in the past, and how can we continue to discuss that and address those issues? And then something else that has been really important to me was the school performances, because I think it's very important to give children an opportunity to see live theater and to access local art. And I went to school performances at the Grand when I was a kid. We used to get on the bus and go to the Grand, and I think that that's just um, something, another really amazing perspective of having uh, youth in, in the arts in Wilmington. I think it's really important. And it's something that the grant uh, has been working on recently that is very special. Okay, so the future of the history hallway. Obviously, we've talked a lot today about the grant's centennial celebration and the history hallway. We're working on it, so hopefully, it should be opened uh, around the time of the sesquicentennial. Um, and it will give us kind of a reminder of what the grant has been up to for the past 150 years. So. Uh, obviously, as I was talking about earlier, a lot of that silencing that has been occurring throughout history is unintentional because you can't retell every single story. So something that we have been talking about a lot is that we'll keep the standard story on the boards and then we'll have QR codes so that people will be able to access more detailed information about things that they might be more interested in specifically. 
And I think that that will really help us to expand our knowledge of the grant's history and the different perspectives in its history. And I think that that will be a really a more interactive element as well so that people in the community can feel more connected to the grant and to its history. Um, and I would invite you all to take a walk down the history hallway, whether now or after it's updated, um, and get some more details and see the pictures. There's a lot of really amazing images in the history hallway and a lot more to come. Um, and I invite you to come join us in the history hallway and we will appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Maya, um, and it's great that you have spent your summer so productively. Uh, it's important to draw us back to this, in part to put a little bit of a, a, a context on this. This is 1879, and Grant is promoting a black agency and African American artists, making clear that it's not blackface, it's not the less. There was plenty of that, plenty of minstrel shows in Grant's history. Uh, but in Delaware in the 1870s, uh, African Americans were given the federal right to vote, but it was nullified by the Delaware legislature. So uh, Delaware African Americans didn't have the right to vote. They didn't have the right to serve on juries or be tried by a jury of their peers. And here is a promotion of the Grand Opera House allowing African Americans to perform. Uh, and the language is hard to take, but you know, we can't impose a 21st century morality on the 19th century or on anything in the past. It's evocative and provocative, but it's important to have this discussion. So thank you for researching this. And it comes to us from the collections of the Paul Preston Davis uh, um, archives, which are, it came to us two years ago uh, to the Delaware History the Historical Society. So continue to see us reveal more of these findings along with many others as we continue to go forward in our work. But this puts the grant in an entirely different context. So thank you for your diligent work uh, as one of the major fellows in the summer of 2021. It's my pleasure now to uh, sort of have a final uh, presenter uh, put some of this into context. Benjamin Cannon is the executive and artistic director of the Wilmington Valley Company, and he is uh, unabashed in his admiration of the grand is the, the sort of spark to his artistic career where he's been a dancer and a performer, an actor uh, in North Carolina, in New York, and across the country, uh, whether film or television or on the stage. And he, um, it, it started when he saw performances at the Grand Opera as a young person. That's what we're meant to do, is carry it forward and, and spark uh, that creative uh, juice in, in the next people uh, and, and those going after us. So I'd like to welcome Benjamin Cannon now to speak a little bit about what you've heard today and, and the role of the grant and the larger uh, life of the region and certainly of the community. Benjamin, thank you. Thank you so much, David, um, the Delta Historical Society and uh, Grand Mark and uh, Pam for having me. I can't tell you how I'm getting emotional. I'm getting emotional because <clears throat> seeing um, this ad, while the language is harsh, <clears throat> really gave me a sense of belonging in that I knew that, uh, I learned that the grand really Yes, there is, um, there is a leg in this fight to continue to um, make sure that all of our arts organizations locally and nationally are honoring the work that African American artists have contributed to this country. Um, and so it's, it's just, it was, it was, it really made me feel very, very, 
strong in all the work that I do and all the work that I have done my entire career um, to know that we should continue to fight um, to make sure that there is diversity and inclusion um, in the arts across the board. Um, I want to share a little bit of my story on all of uh, the grand. Um, the grand is very, very prominent in uh, the, the, the grand is the one reason why I'm actually standing here today. Um, so I grew up um, in Southbridge, which is uh, a few miles from here. If you take the William J. Winchester Bridge um, and continue south, uh, you will head into the community that I grew up in. It's still there. Um, it's one of the first African American communities in the city. We're very proud of that. But you should know that William J. Winchester was my great uncle. That bridge is named after him. Um, and he was the adopted father of Len Winchester, um, who was one of Wilmington's celebrated jazz musicians. Um, just today, as I came into the building for the first time, this beautiful building, by the way, I haven't been here in a long time, I went over <clears throat> and saw my uncle, Len Winchester, and my grandmother, Millie Cannon, who were both Wilmington jazz artists, um, celebrated in the exhibit downstairs. And that really made me just overwhelmed with, with emotion as I am now. Um, and also just sitting here and listening to all of the wonderful things and all of the wonderful energy put into restoring the rain and making sure that it is the continues to be the leader of Fox Culture Delaware. I mean, it's just been amazing. Um, but I'm sharing my story not because I want you to um, give me applause or anything like that. I'm sharing my story because I want you to understand how the arts and culture of this uh, organization has affected my life and how it continues to affect lives of people that I encounter as well. So Lennon Winchester and Millie Cannon um, were my grandmother and my uncle respectively, and they played in a lot of the old theaters that used to be right here downtown in the surrounding area. Um, and I was very lucky as a kid to visit my grandmother's home on several occasions on B Street and see a lot of the artists who had been performing in the jazz clubs and in the theaters. Um, they used to come to our house and um, hang out <laughs> after their shows. And my grandmother would cook for them, they would sing, and there was a, um, there was a big jam session. So the arts and, cult arts and culture really um, affected um, as influenced and formed my life. I had the pleasure of being a Helena Antonio scholarship student at the Academy of Dance, which was founded by James Jameson and um, Helena Antonova in 1966 here in Delaware. Um, I was there as a scholarship student, um, and my first time ever being in a theater was when I was taken to the Playhouse for rehearsals for an production of the Nutcracker. And my life changed when I walked into the grandeur and the beauty of the Playhouse Theater. It was, and it still does, make me very emotional to think about. I was there yesterday, and actually in Mark, and it was a wonderful time to be there, and I'm always excited. So that theater is sacred ground to me, and so is the Grand Opera House sacred ground to me. Because when I was a junior in the 11th grade at Del, at Del Paso Technical High School, I was studying dance um, secretly. I didn't want anybody to know because I didn't want to be judged for my choice of art form. <laughs> um, and um, Mr. Jameson, God rest his soul, took me to a master class that was being held on the stage of the Grand Theater by the North Carolina Dance Theater. And I just went to the master class, and after the master class was over, the then artistic director, Salvatore Aiello, um, invited me down um, backstage and literally offered me a contract as a soloist to dance with the North Carolina Dance Theater. Um, and that literally changed my life because all of a sudden I was given access to something that I thought was not uh, accessible to me. And that experience has uh, really informed my life and allowed me to be in front of you here today. I have um, I spent uh, several years as a soloist with the North Carolina Dance Theater, um, touring the world and touring the country, and learning about different cultures that I didn't have access to when I was just a, 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 um, growing up in Southbridge. And uh, it's, it's been phenomenal um, to know that uh, these places exist, that we as artists can come, um, no matter what we look like, no matter what our backgrounds are, and we can create and have these experiences and we can um, change other people's lives and, and move uh, move and, and, and move mountains um, culturally. So 
it's uh, I, I thank the Ray, and I've never been able to say thank you to the Ray for that experience. Um, but I went into the North Carolina Dance for two years, and then I left the company to pursue acting in New York. Um, and started acting in theater and dance there as well, play with the Playwrights Horizons Theater School, and eventually made my Broadway debut in The Lion King. Um, and um, I'm from South Korea, if you want to say that again. I'm going to say that again. Thank you. Thank you. But that opportunity came with, um, you know, a lot of grief as well. As I, as I traveled the country um, as one of the only African American company members in the North Carolina Dance Theater at the time, um, I saw how it was, uh, I was, uh, the audience, some audience reactions were different for the performances that I gave. We did travel in the South a lot. Um, things had changed, but not that much. Um, um, it, so it really gave me, uh, it gave me an education on how important it is that we demystify these uh, things that we have learned about each other that are untrue. And so um, at the North Carolina Dance Theater is when I started working in arts education and realized that arts education really is a really phenomenal inroad to help to start demystifying um, um, these cultural bar barriers that we have, these things that we, um, these things that keep us separate. So it, is, it has been phenomenal. Um, uh, being able to learn this history to, to, uh, um, over the past couple of, a couple of months when we uh, talked about it. I think Maya so much for doing the research that she's doing. I'm so glad that a young person from Wilmington is interested in history and also interested in theater um, uh, because it's important. Um, the, cult, the creative things that we do are the things that um, motivate and move our lives when we work creatively. And we want to work creatively together. I mean, there's no stopping what we can do. So I'm just excited by that, um, by the, the, the ability to use our creativity. And I thank the brand for all the wonderful programming that they do in the community um, to make sure that everybody has a chance to um, have the experience that I had um, as a kid um, growing up. Just recently, um, Miss uh, Delaware, Sophie Phillips, was working in Southbridge um, at a community garden. She started a community garden there, and there was a young boy named LJ who was dancing around and not doing a lot of talking. And she started filming him while he was doing backflips and spinning around. And she put um, this film on Instagram and tagged the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater in this tag. And when, when they did that, uh, the, some of those dancers started reaching out to Akua Parker, who is a Wilmington, uh, Wilmingtonian, a uh, former Academy of the Dance uh, dancer who went on to study and I mean, went on to be a principal dancer with the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater and the Dance Theater Parlor. She is um, featured in our current Nutcracker um, that's going to be playing pretty soon. And she was on her way down to rehearsal to the studio when she got this um, message from some of her friends at Alvin Ailey American, American Dance Theater and saw this video of this little black boy jumping and twisting and turning on the street. And so she rushed into the studio and said, oh my gosh, we've got to find out where this little kid is. And I was like, wow, that, that street looks really familiar. I, I wonder where that is. I mean, it looks familiar. So through a network of about five or six different teachers in several different school districts here in London, they all figured out that it was Southbridge and that um, the little boy was actually um, from Southbridge. And I immediately broke down the tears, which I'm very successful to be Because I all of a sudden, I saw myself there in that little boy. And so we tracked him down, and now LJ is going to be a Wilmington Valley Academy to Dance scholarship student like I was, at six like I was, and he's going to make his debut in our nonprofit this year on December 17th. And that just melts my heart because he's going to have the experience that I had in the space that I had, my experience as well, and Hopefully one day, um, he will be here thanking the grand. The grand now will run the playoffs. It didn't used to be that way. Y'all know that, right? <laughs> Which we're very excited by. We're excited that the grand is the, um, the leader in, um, in theatrical presentation here in the city. It's so phenomenal. But it just makes me, it just makes me smile and, and warms my heart to know that if I hadn't had that experience, 
um, at that master class and hadn't been hired um, when I was in the frame to be a soloist, that I might not be standing here now sharing the story that I hope is the beginning of Elgin's story. I hope that you will um, continue to support the arts. It is so important. I know that it's been a tumultuous time um, this year. Um, we all are sitting here in face masks. Um, I am very, very scared of the pandemic. I've lost 32 people this past year, so that's why I'm continuing to wear my mask. Um, but the one thing that has um, uh, allowed us to do is recognize how much we need each other as we have sat in our homes, hoping to be with our friends and our loved ones, and hoping to go to the theater, hoping to go to the opera, hoping to go to a concert or anything. Um, it, it helped us to reorganize a lot of us, I believe, our minds and um, so that we can find ways uh, and more meaningful ways to gather and, and work together. So um, that's what I've taken out of it. I try to, try to look at everything in a very, very positive way. Um, but uh, we're, we're, just, we're just phenomenally blessed to be able to be sitting in this room together because back in 1879, that would not, that would not happen. And uh, you know, we still have a lot of work to do, but uh, I'm glad that the brand is at the forefront of that work. And they're very intentional about making sure that this organization is a community-based organization that it truly reflects the community. And that's exactly what we're doing at the Women's Valley as well. We're demystifying the things that um, uh, people say we can't do. Traditionally, again, uh, African-American people have thought to not be able-bodied to do classical work, and um, that's what struck me here. Um, and it's something that I continue to still fight um, as a leader of, in, a, in a ballet company. In the ballet industry right now, lots of people are speaking about um, the racism that happens, and we're trying to be really intentional about making sure that we don't offend anyone as we create art. Um, one of the things we did um, and we're excited about is that we changed our um, Chinese tea, which is one of the preferred small model dances that happens in the second act of Black Rider. It's usually done with um, yellow face um, and usually very derogatory movements and costuming. And so uh, we had the pleasure of bringing Georgina Pazbillan from the New York City Valley, who's the first Asian American um, soloist, Asian American woman to ever be a soloist in, in the New York City Valley. She has worked with us for the past year, and she and author Phil Chan wrote a book called The Final Ballot for the Yellow Face, where they talk about um, changing that stereotype, including that people will make a different choice when they're presenting in the Friday. So we actually decided to present the Matthew Paulson Paulson High School of Irish Dancing in place of the um, traditional Chinese tea. And uh, they posted a video online that went, very, that went viral, and um, they were uh, people were very excited by that. So you know, things ch change change happens, and it can happen, but we have to really make it happen. We can't rely on tradition. Um, we have to move forward so that uh, again we reflect the people that we're trying to serve. Um, so I'm very excited um, again to just be here. Um, and as I look at all these faces, I'm. I'm just amazed at um, what the power of, 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 of like-minded thinking um, can do. So I'm not going to take too much more time, but I do want to say that we are um, doing a conversation tomorrow at the Buckwood College, College School about the changing face of the arts. We have a couple of different arts leaders, including Georgina, um, coming down tomorrow as well. So if you'd like to join us, you can go to womensandvalley.org. Um, and uh, any, any, uh, if you come and support us, you'll support the work that we do in the community as well. Um, and our Nutcracker is, is going to be running December 17th to the 19th at the Playhouse Theater. We're very excited to, um, to be back in the theater this year, as well as I know some of you are, and I hope that you will support our work, and I hope that you support all the work of all the artists in Wilmington. We all need each other. We all need each other to continue to support each other. We need audiences to continue to support us. Um, we are better together. And um, I just want to say, lastly, uh, again, thank you so much. Please, please, please do all you can to learn about someone who looks different from you. Please do all you can to, uh, to learn about culture uh, that might be different from what you've been taught um, because under all of the skin, our blood is the same. And we all need to learn how to um, uplift each other as just as the building does um, when, when we walk past the brain. I love um, David's analogy of the brain that it, it rises and it truly does. It makes you look up at it. It doesn't jut out at you, it makes you look up at it. And I think that um, that's what we can do as people as well. We can uplift and uh, help people to see themselves as better. 
So thank you so very much. I hope that you all have a very safe holiday season. Please come to the Grand, come to the Delaware Historical Society, go down and check my family out downstairs. I'm still excited about that. And <laughs> we would love to um, um, just say God bless all of those people who can't be here, the ones that we've lost, um, and we can uh, look forward to building a better future again. Thank you so much. Well, Benjamin, thank you so much. That was fantastic. And um, it speaks to the connections that we can make personally in the arts, cultural, and heritage communities. Uh, you were down in our Mitchell Center for African American Heritage, discovering your own roots of connections and discovery. Uh, we, we don't know enough about the past, and we can only learn it together from other perspectives. Um, so if you're not going to the movies at the Grand tomorrow at 1 p.m. at the Buckingham School in the Castle, is a really provocative conversation about the changing face of the arts. There's a, a flyer here I'll share with uh, on, on the back. Uh, two other things. Um, we'd like you to fill out evaluations and we have pens and paper to do that. Our funders really like to find out what you think and what surprised you about our programming. Um, and I would just call your attention to all the things that are going on both at the Grand and uh, at the Wilmington Network and also the Delaware Historical Society. And let's just take a step back and consider that one building is a community anchor, a preservation pathbreaker, uh, an engine of economic revitalization for Wilmington, an architectural beauty, and a, a, leading, architect, or a leading artistic launching pad for great up and coming performers. Uh, its role in arts and cultural uh, and heritage life in the region is unsurpassed. The brand is more than a building. Thanks very much, and let's keep uh, giving life to history. Thank you very much. I think Bob and uh, Benjamin and Maya and Pam and I are open to questions if folks in the audience have them. We're certainly uh, willing to take questions, and we can continue on the conversation. But are there any direct questions? Yes, Mr. Fields. So, David, you mentioned that Thomas Dixon, a lot of his work was Gothic. We've always described the Grand as being designed in the Second Empire style. Is that incorrect? Is it really a Gothic architectural uh, style, or is it Second Empire? It's both and, uh, and uh, the reasons are because the answer groups. So let me go back a little bit. But the, because it doesn't have the the uh, doesn't have the spires, uh, so these mansard rooms are named after uh, Mansard, who was the architect of Napoleon III in Paris. Uh, and uh, and so yes, that Second Empire. Uh, but then the triplets are gothic, the, the, just a very uh, uh, elevated nature. The, uh, it suggests gothic, the ornamentality of the tall windows is very gothic. But, uh, but it, it, so it's gothic in certain respects, certainly in the interior, um, but not so much from the outside. It is definitely the Second Empire when you take it uh, piece by piece. So I think you should continue on and not change the tour in any way. <laughs> Uh, the, the front also is filled with uh, Masonic symbolism. Uh, you've got the Corinthian columns, and the, the, the sacred numbers of three, five, and seven uh, are uh, present there. The windows in groups of three, but for instance, on the top, if you, if you count from one end to the middle, you come to the seven, the same from the other side. Um, it's, it's all in there. You've got the all seeing eye of God uh, up there in the center. Uh, there are three niches that were to be for statues, but they were never they were never filled with statues. Uh, so there's just a lot of symbolism there, uh, and uh, the Masons can probably tell you more about that than I can. And it continues to be a meeting space for the Masons. Right, right. <clears> on <throat> the second and third floor are the uh, the meeting spaces and the lodges, and then the uh, the ancient the, the letters. Uh, a F A N ancient free and accepted masons are up there uh, in the center as well. So we can continue to learn from the building 
in addition to enjoy great performances. Other questions? Yes, sir. The, uh, to my knowledge, he was not. I'm telling you, was uh, Thomas Dixon and Mason? No, he was not. Um, it, it could well have been. I don't know. <laughs> Mayhaps, perhaps we can find out a little bit more. Uh, but it continues to reveal, as even the archives show us new things we didn't know about a building we think we know very well. I believe he was not a Mason because I just remembered uh, he actually wrote a letter to the Masons after he had finished his design process saying how nice they were and how much he liked working with the Masons. So I don't think he was. But he wasn't, so he wasn't given the honorary aid or anything. Not to my Well, thank you all for your time and attention today. Um, one way to take in experiences like Benjamin had in our Mitchell Center. Uh, or in our work in our research library and our uh, education programs at the Reed House is to become a member of the Delaware Historical Society uh, and your support will help us bring art, history, and culture to life for young people and throughout the region. Uh, and we have membership material on that. Uh, it gets you into all sorts of things at free or at discounted rates. It gets you our Delaware History Journal, which has been published since 1946. And uh, it, we have a number of initiatives that we're going to be continuing to reveal hidden sections of our collections. So become a member, stay tuned, stay connected, and let's enjoy the kinds of events that we have here today that celebrate the life of great organizations like the Grand Opera. And happy 150th. Right.